part of the accident. But what could have caused such a catastrophic failure? For a tail to simply fall off a plane is virtually unprecedented. Of the hundreds of eyewitnesses who saw the crash, there is no doubt. This was a bomb. And I saw an explosion in the sky, and I saw the plane it looked like one of its wings fell off. Just aiming for the ground, and, and I felt an impact, and then I saw smoke. And my neighbor was yelling, take cover, and I really thought, this is it, they've started bombing now. Even for a trained investigator, it's difficult not to jump to conclusions. We're not supposed to speculate at early stages of any investigation. It was very hard not to in this particular case. Hang on to it. Hang on to it. Hey, Mike, get over here. Got it. Right in there. Right in there. After the crash of an airliner into the New York borough of Queens, FBI forensic experts are searching for evidence of a bomb. They are also hoping to find two other key pieces of evidence, the plane's black boxes. The cockpit voice recorder should have recorded everything that was said by the pilots. The flight data recorder could tell them exactly how the plane performed throughout the flight. Each of the black boxes might unlock the mystery of the crash, but lead investigator Bob Benson knows finding either of them is likely to take days. Even then, they could be badly damaged. But just hours into the search comes an amazing stroke of luck. Marion Blakey, spokeswoman for the NTSB, makes an announcement. We have recovered the voice de co cockpit voice recorder. By now, there is a frenzy of speculation over the incident. Terrorism is foremost in people's minds. But for Benson and the NTSB, the lack of any corroborating evidence to support the theory is troubling. There is no sign of suspicious activity at the airport, and no group has stepped forward to claim responsibility for the crash. They take a calculated risk and announce that even at this early stage, they believe this was not a deliberate act. It is the case that the National Transportation Safety Board is the lead agency because all information we have currently is that this is an accident. The plan backfires. Suspicious New Yorkers start to wonder if this is a cover-up. The NTSB takes steps to reassure the public. Should there be any indications of criminal activity, we will certainly make certain that the public knows as soon as we are aware of that and the investigation would change at that point appropriately. For Benson and his team, the pressure is mounting. Finding the cockpit voice recorder is a huge step forward. With one of the black boxes and the tail fin in his possession, hopes are high they will be able to piece together the reasons behind the crash. Although the recorder is damaged, the tape is still intact and is rushed to NTSB headquarters in Washington. Away from the glare of the media, investigators start to analyze the chilling final moments of the flight. Let's go for power, please. Every word, every sound is carefully analyzed. 89 seconds into the flight comes a chilling sound on the tape. There is a loud bang. Immediately afterwards, the crew can be heard struggling with the controls. You all right? Yeah, I'm fine. Hang on to it. Hang on to it. Could this bang be the sound of an explosion? Perhaps there was a bomb after all. With the second black box, the flight data recorder still missing in the smoking wreckage, Benson knows that the truth will be hard to find. Without that, it makes telling the story more speculative and more difficult. For two days, investigators hunt through mountains of debris for the vital recorder. But instead of where they are looking, the next lead comes from three kilometers away. A pair of security cameras on the Triborough Bridge have captured the last moments of the aircraft. These tapes could hold the key to the disaster. In the grainy footage, the Airbus can just be seen as a black dot. 
On one camera, the dot disappears behind a building. Then the second camera picks it up. It shows what could be a crucial moment, a faint white streak just visible trailing behind the aircraft. Is this the explosion seen by so many eyewitnesses? Is this the cause of the sound after which the pilot lost control? This could be hard evidence to prove that there was a bomb after all. The only way to find out is to compare the time. If the white streak happened at the same time as the bang captured by the voice recorder, the two are likely to be the same event. Investigators visit the site of the toll booth cameras. Using buildings as reference points, they work out exactly where and when the streak occurred. The results back up their theory that this was not a bomb. We can see that the streak began eight seconds after the initiating accident sequence. The calculations show the streak occurred after the bang on the recorder. The flash is probably fuel escaping as the plane breaks up. This can't be the start of the accident, although it could be the reason so many people thought they saw an explosion. Then, back at the crash site, comes a dramatic development. Investigators get the news they have been desperate to hear. Searchers have recovered the flight data recorder. But the relief is short-lived. The black box is damaged. The NTSB sent it back to the manufacturers to see what, if anything, can be retrieved. Now, the tail fin that was found floating in Jamaica Bay is starting to yield vital clues. The first thing investigators notice is that the fin is built from a high-tech material called reinforced carbon fiber composite. Often used in racing cars and sports equipment, composites consist of layers of carbon fibers bound tightly together with resin. The A300-600 was one of the earliest civil aircraft to feature this high-strength material, and it's used in many areas of the plane. But when investigators look closely, immediately alarm bells begin to ring. There are six main attaching points connecting the tail to the fuselage. All six have given way. There has never been a plane crash caused by a composite failure, but Benzen can rule nothing out. You have to imagine a force large enough to break six attaching points made out of uh, one of the strongest materials in the world, six of these holding the vertical stabilizer on, and, and all of them broke. So the, the forces had to be just tremendous. The detail of the failure is what worries the team. Plans show how each of the six attaching points has two lugs. One made from aluminium, the other from composites, connected by a titanium bolt. The damage shows that the metal lugs and the bolts remained intact, but the composite lugs all gave way. Benzen has to consider the appalling prospect that the composite material itself may be faulty. With 240 similar planes still in service and thousands more using similar technology, it would have huge implications throughout the aviation industry. If there's something that the composite uh, creators or designers missed 25 years ago, it's now just starting to rear its ugly head. That's bad news for a lot of airplanes that are already flying. Proving that the carbon fiber is to blame will need hard physical evidence. Benzen urgently dispatches the stabilizer to specialist labs at NASA to see if they can detect any weakness. Using scanning electron microscopes, experts check over 3,000 square centimeters of surface, magnifying the material by up to 5,000 times as they search for any imperfection. 
It's a painstakingly slow process, and the pressure is building on Benzon and his team all the time. It keeps you awake at night. Uh, you've got a lot riding on these things, and the eyes of the world initially, and, and then later on, the eyes at least of the aviation industry are, are, are on us. The pressure is also growing on Airbus. Is the design of their aircraft at fault? Has there been an error during assembly? They scrutinize every lug, bolt, and fitting on the tail, including the vertical stabilizer, as it is called. After hundreds of hours of work, studying Airbus's design and construction methods, NASA and NTSB scientists finally give the plane a clean bill of health. They can find nothing wrong with the aircraft or the materials used to build it. While the news is welcome, it only serves to deepen the mystery. Although we were relieved in that aspect, we knew we had a long row ahead of us because we still had no idea why the vertical stabilizer really came off. Then, just as the investigation seems to have stalled, comes a vital turning point. Information from the damaged flight data recorder has at last been retrieved. I was very, very relieved. But no one is prepared for the startling picture that the flight data recorder will give. The focus of the entire investigation suddenly shifts from the machine to the man flying it, co-pilot Sten Molen. 83 seconds after takeoff, the recorder shows that Molen applied five extreme movements of the rudder, causing the plane to lurch violently from side to side. The plane slips sideways to its direction of travel, first one way and then the other. I've looked at a lot of flight data readouts in my time. I've never, ever seen that particular type of activity occur. They realize that traveling at nearly 470 kilometers per hour, the aerodynamic stresses on the 130-ton Airbus would have been extraordinary. They were virtually unprecedented to us. We were amazed. It seems as though on the fifth movement of the rudder, the entire tail fin broke off. The implication is extraordinary. Simply by manipulating the controls, the pilot broke the aircraft. The NTSB is so concerned, they take immediate action. On February 8, 2002, they issue a special warning to all pilots of this new danger. But the board have yet to prove that the tail came off simply due to aerodynamic forces. Many pilots doubt that such a thing is possible. The only way to be sure is to run detailed computer simulations, a process which could take months to perform. If the theory is right, then the idea that a terrorist plot must be behind the tragedy can finally be laid to rest. Benzon now faces a new and disturbing mystery. Why did the pilot act in this way? Investigators believe they are close to uncovering the cause of the tragic crash of flight 587. The flight data recorder shows that the co-pilot, Sten Molen, applied five rapid inputs to the aircraft's rudder pedals, which could have overstressed the tail fin, causing it to break off completely. Now the question is, why would he do such a thing? They listen again to the cockpit voice recorder. We're supposed to be five miles by the time we're airborne. One possible theory is wake turbulence. Wake turbulence is all too familiar to accident investigators. It's a region of spinning air left behind as a plane passes. These vortices can sometimes turn a following plane upside down. But the team quickly realized that this cannot be the cause of the crash. The turbulence was not strong enough to seriously affect a plane the size of the Airbus. The bigger the airplane, the less effect wake turbulence has on it. The A300 is a pretty big airplane. Then comes evidence which changes everything. The investigation team interview Molan's friends and colleagues. 
and they discover a vital piece of information. A pilot and former colleague recalled an earlier trip with Molan. During an encounter with turbulence, he used the rudder aggressively, even though there was no apparent risk to the plane. The evidence is conclusive. Molin had reacted in the same way before. When those uh, pilots came forward and told us about the first officer's propensity to overreact on the rudders, that was a eureka moment for us. But the revelations don't stop there. When questioned at the time, Molin said he had been taught, trained to use the rudder in this way by American Airlines. If this is true, it raises serious concerns for Benzon and the team. One would assume that if, if many pilots go through, through the same training program with some flaws in it, then a lot of pilots have wrong ideas about how to fly uh, an airplane. With 712 planes in service with American Airlines, Benzon must quickly establish where the truth lies. The airline confirms one of their programs does indeed teach pilots to use the rudder to recover from unusual situations, as seen in this training video. And if you don't put that rudder in, what's going to happen? When you get to this portion of the roll, she's going to slice out just like that. Next, Benzon looks at the other tools used to train the pilots, particularly the high-tech flight simulators. Here, pilots are taught to react to a range of emergencies, including wake turbulence. In one of those scenarios, Benzon discovers that the pilots learned to use the rudder very aggressively. The flight simulator program had even been altered to encourage the use of the rudder, particularly when the plane was banking to the right or the left. Airbus themselves had already written to the airline, saying this practice was a cause for concern. The classroom work uh, told pilots that it was permissible to use the rudder to escape from uh, unusual attitude situations. And perhaps more importantly, in the simulator, uh, they were taught to use the rudder very, very aggressively to recover from unusual attitudes. The finding causes controversy. At a public hearing, American Airlines claim that Airbus had not explained there were limits to the use of the rudder. I didn't know you couldn't do that. You couldn't do what? Sorry. Be aggressive with the controls. The airline also claims that the rudder system on the aircraft was very sensitive and that pilots might not be aware how much rudder they were really applying. The NTSB investigate and discover the rudder control system is highly sensitive. What's more, the controls of the plane become more sensitive as the plane increases speed. On the ground, the rudder pedal has to be depressed by 10 centimeters to get maximum deflection. But when flying at high speed, that distance reduces to just four centimeters. NTSB officials are shocked to find that this system is not explained in training manuals. There was an apparent uh, gap between what the manufacturers knew about the rudder sensitivity of the airplane and what was filtering down to the folks that actually flew them. Then finally come the results from the analysis of Molin's five rudder inputs. They confirm what nobody really wants to believe, that it's indeed possible to tear the tail fin from an aircraft in flight by stamping violently on the foot pedals. Now Benzen and the team can see exactly what happened to Flight 587. Step by step, they have pieced together the key events that led to the tragedy. Five minutes to disaster. Flight 587 awaits clearance for takeoff. Taxi in position and hold. As a Japanese 747 airliner takes off. 30 seconds later, Flight 587 is given a warning of wake turbulence. Two minutes to disaster, Flight 587 takes off. Positive right, gear up, please. One minute to disaster, 587 encounters turbulence for the first time. Sten Molen flies through it. 
30 seconds to disaster, 587 hits a second, larger wave of turbulence. The plane is now banking to the left, reminding Molin of his simulator training. Rudder movement! Not realizing how sensitive the rudder system becomes in flight, Molin stamps on the pedal, causing maximum rudder deflection. The plane swings violently to the right, placing enormous loads on the tail fin. Investigators believe that an astonished Molin thinks that the plane is reacting to the wake turbulence. He doesn't realize that his own use of the rudder causes the violent movement. Molin immediately slams the rudder pedal into the opposite position. The plane now swings violently back to the left, placing another enormous load on the tail. Both Molin and States believe the plane is somehow caught in the turbulence. What the hell are we into? I'm stuck in it! Get out of it! And in a desperate attempt to get control, Molin applies another rudder input, this time to the right. Now, thoroughly disorientated, Molin again applies full rudder. 587 is now on the brink of disaster. Finally, on the fifth rudder input, all six lugs connecting the tail to the fuselage tear apart. The plane is now doomed. Terrified passengers and crew can have no idea what is happening. Huge G-forces rip both engines away. 106 seconds after takeoff, Flight 587 falls from the sky. 265 people are dead. Important lessons have been learned from the tragedy. Airbus have issued a bulletin reminding pilots how to use the rudder, and American Airlines have modified their training program. Together with the NTSB, the aviation industry has moved to ensure that such a terrible accident will never happen again.